you, uh, we've gone now from Al Christie Studios to Century to Universal. To how education. Did, to education. How did you get to uh, Al Rich Studios? Uh, well, a funny thing with that, uh, Stan Laurel, in the meantime, had gone from uh, Universal to uh, Roach, and he had been telling Mr. Roach about me. He thought I was clever. <coughs> I had him fooled, didn't I? Anyway, he told Hal Roach all about me, and uh, Hal Roach said, I thought I was fine, yeah. So I never did get to the Roach studio through Stan Laurel, but my uh, manager at the time, Mr. Roach had seen some uh, show I was in, and I was hired to uh, play with Mabel Norman. She was trying to make a comeback. I had to wear a blonde wig. And I was on the lot about three days, and all of a sudden, coming towards me, Stan Laurel with Mr. Roach. And got close enough, Stan gave me a big hello and all, and he turned to Hal Roach and said, this is the girl I've been telling you about. And Roach is, oh, why'd you tell me? <laughs> Silly, but uh, that's how I remember the first time that I met Mr. Roach. He had seen me in other things before, that's why I got the job there. And from then on, it seemed that uh, made one picture after the other. Can you tell there's been a lot of talk, a lot of written about Hal Roach, and about his personality, about whatever genius he had for producing comedy. Can you give us a thumbnail sketch of what he was like, uh, what you knew and what you saw at the studio? Well, I didn't know him very well. And... Uh, he intimidated me. I, I didn't like to be around him because he'd scare me to death. You gotta realize I'm still in my teens when I'm there. And uh, I, uh, for that reason, I think Hal Roach knew that he intimidated people. And I think he stayed away from the sound stages or the silent stages, whatever time of the year it was. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. As I remember him, he was a very athletic man. He looked as if he worked out every day. I, I think he did. But I didn't know him well at all. What is there about the, the films at the Roach Studio that makes them so universal today? Is it, was it just the fact that originally there was no sound and therefore language played a secondary point? It's universal because even young people today can find something to, to laugh and identify with. Yes. I think that uh, primarily it's motion pictures. And Stan Laurel always said, cut down on the dialogue. Remember, we're making motion pictures. And that's what we did. We didn't have very many lines. And uh, we kind of uh, went along with what came naturally. You didn't stick uh, strictly uh, when the director would say, well, your line is this, that, and the other thing. You'd change it around to make it comfortable for you make it more natural, what was natural for you. Do I make myself clear? Oh, I remember uh, listening to uh, little Gish, who was talking at one, uh, about a year or two years ago, who said that motion pictures lost something with sound was added. It, it lost the whole dimension of universality. Oh, that I, I, I really believe. Of course, you can't go back to it, but I think as an audience, I remember myself as a child, when I'd go into a, a motion picture theater, I was up there on the screen. You'd lose yourself completely, but once the screen started to talk, you were you and they were they. <laughs> You're no longer lost in the story. The, when you decided to, to go with Roach and uh, got your chance to, to go with that studio, uh, you had to know that you would be doing comedy work instead of uh, drama. Did you feel that you lost something in not having a dramatic career uh, as, as much as you would if you'd stayed with Universal, for example? Well, uh, even while I was doing the comedies at Hal Roach Studio, I was also working on the outside. MGM and uh, uh, Century Fox Studio and 
that's where I made their dramatic pictures. Uh, were you low down, as they say, or did, were you permitted to work outside of a particular period of time? Oh yes, yeah. I could do what, uh, what I wanted to do. And uh, if I was working elsewhere, they got somebody else to do what they wanted me for. What was Hollywood like in, in that period of time? Can you give us some idea of uh, what the atmosphere was like in Hollywood? Well, I, I think those days, maybe for a certain set, outside of uh, like the F. Scott Fitzgerald set and the Benchley and all that, I think the rest of Hollywood was very naive, very different than it is today. And uh, I uh, never went with that uh, fast set. My mother, uh, with her Irish temper, would have killed me, hit me over the head. And what Mama said went. What, what did you mean when you said naive? You just meant that it was not the Babylon that we were all living uh, with? No, uh, really, I think that uh, somebody just uh, maybe picked up on a few people that were very uh, earthy and forgot about uh, the whole. And I don't think that uh, Hollywood was in the 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, anything like uh, they painted. I really don't. I didn't see any of that. Can you tell us a little bit about your career and the films that you made uh, with, uh, outside of uh, the Laurel and Hardy films and the Roach? I know that you mentioned that you were in the 20th century box. Mm -hmm. uh, what actors and actresses did you work with that you were going to recall? Give us uh -huh. some idea about well, it's Johnny Mac Brown, Madge Bellamy, Greta Garbo, uh, Walter McGrath. All these names that mean nothing today, I guess. Oh, I wouldn't say. <laughs> Certainly Garbo. Well, oh, uh, yes. Well, Johnny Mac Brown was. He was a. Was he a star? Yes. Mac Brown was pretty good western stuff. So. Yes, he was. He was very good and very good looking. He had everything for a. Uh, to be a big Western star. Well, she worked with Thelma Todd and Sandra Pitts. That, that's what we were talking about. We were just talking about that before you arrived. About Thelma Todd and Sandra Pitts. Who had been, they had been paired as a, as a comedy team. We don't mm -hmm. think of uh, specifically them arising out of comedy. It was Sandra Pitts' uh, career. Oh, yes. It ended you know, with comedy and yeah. shorts and that sort of thing. Well, before Pitts and Todd, it was Garvin and Byron, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the pair of tights. That, I think was our first picture. They were trying to make a female Laurel and Hardy out of us. And, uh, oh, for some reason or other, I, I think we made about three or four pictures. Maybe it didn't go over, or, I don't know. But uh, pair of tights, supposed to be a classic now. And uh, I can't remember the name the other pictures I made with uh, Mary and Byron, but uh, I enjoyed it, nevertheless. What's her background? Has she been in, in, in vaudeville? Or in I don't think so. Uh, Mary was about 17 years old, and uh, I, I don't know her background at all, but I do know that she's one of the sweetest, loveliest people in the world. I noticed that looking at your film, right? on screen you have the impression of being incredibly tall. Uh huh. Is that is that just an impression, or is it I think it's an impression. I'm five six. Short coast guard. And uh, six inch heels. Uh, I well, I always wore high heels. I still do, even now that I'm 18 years old. <laughs> I still wear my high heels, and I think. Oh, now I'm considered short. I mean, the young people today are six feet tall. Especially girls. The girls are much taller than they used to be. And uh, I did give the impression of being very tall. And it may have been the Ziegfeld training of walking very tall and straight. And I had uh, a certain dignity about me at the time. You mentioned that uh, your uh, mother would not have approved if you had gone into any, anything even slightly off. Well, what was your family like? You said they came from the East first. Yes, I was born and raised in New York City. I left there 
before my 16th birthday on the way out uh, west with the show. I had my 16th birthday in Denver and uh, I came to the west coast in the show, which I had left to go into pictures. 